Good evening. My name is Alan Mattiso. I'm the Associate Director of the Baker Institute. The principal function of the Baker Institute is to promote research in uh, public policy, on public policy questions, but we do something else here. We bring to the university and to the podium of the Baker Institute figures who are active in the world of, of public policy. We bring uh, academics, journalists, statesmen, politicians, people with interesting and important things to say. And in that regard, we're especially uh, privileged tonight to have as our speaker, Bernard-Henri Levy. There is no analog in the United States uh, to uh, Professor Levy. Uh, he is a philosopher, a public intellectual, a war correspondent, a, a human rights activist, a maker of documentaries, and a media celebrity in France. He is, by consensus, the best known intellectual uh, uh, among the French people. He was uh, born in 1949 in Algeria, uh, received a degree in philosophy at the École uh, Nationale Supérieure uh, in 1969, and before he was 30, already had a career uh, that made him one of the most uh, distinguished people in, in the French, uh, in the nation of France. He went uh, to Bangladesh in 1971 and 1972 and covered the Civil War there, the War for Independence. Uh, and on the basis of his experiences in Bangladesh, wrote his first book, which as it turned out, was the first of more than 30 books which have been published uh, in the last 35 years. Uh, he held posts in um, philosophy at distinguished universities, and in 1977, uh, he became um, uh, recognized as the head of a group of uh, French thinkers called the New Philosophers. Uh, in that year, uh, he wrote um, uh, a book called Barbarians with a Human Face. And that book is a scathing attack on Marxism as a philosophy and on those French intellectuals uh, who made that philosophy uh, their religion. In the 1980s, he formed the, uh, the uh, leading civil rights group in, in France. In 1994, he was in Bosnia champion, championing uh, the victims of that country. In 2002, uh, he was in Afghanistan uh, uh, as a cultural envoy of the foreign ministry, uh, French foreign ministry. And while he was there, uh, Daniel Pearl, uh, was uh, killed by al-Qaeda in a particularly grisly murder. Uh, Mr. Levy decided to investigate that murder and rather courageously uh, retraced the steps of uh, Daniel Pearl uh, from Karachi to Kandahar, London. Uh, he went to London, he went to Washington to, for the research. And the, the result was a book called Who Killed Daniel Pearl? In this book, uh, Mr. Levy offers the hypothesis that um, Daniel Pearl was not killed because he was an American, because he was Jewish, because he was a, a journalist, but because he was uh, investigating too carefully the connections between Al-Qaeda and segments of the ISI, uh, the Pakistani Civil um, uh, Secret Service. Uh, that book is controversial, and in fact, most of the books uh, that uh, Mr. Levy writes is, is controversial. He's, he is willing to go against the grain. As for example, he's a leading voice in France against what he regards as mindless and malignant anti-Americanism. In 2003, when the Atlantic Monthly was looking for a French intellectual to retrace the steps of uh, Alexis de Tocqueville in 1831, uh, the logical choice, in fact, in retrospect, the inevitable choice was uh, Mr. Levy. He says in his introduction that when he was a student um, in Paris in the 1960s, when Mao Zedong was the fount of all wisdom, uh, he and his generation paid no attention to Tocqueville. But this assignment took him back to Tocqueville and uh, made him appreciate the, the genius of, of Tocqueville. But it all, he also learned that you could not do in the 21st century what Tocqueville did uh, in the 19th. And he uses as, as his model as much as Tocqueville, a Jack Kerouac, who goes on the road uh, to look at America. And the result, if you haven't read it, is a book of fascinating fragments of the things that he saw 
along the way. Um, a rabbi in Brooklyn, a lap dancer in Las Vegas, um, uh, famous politicians and celebrities. He falls in love with Seattle. He goes to New Orleans and he says before Katrina that this city will be underwater. Uh, showing a fair amount, I think, of prescience. That book um, concludes with a meditation that asks this question. Uh, and the question is how out of these fragments, the fragments that are America, uh, can there be a nation? Out of the many, uh, can there be one? Uh, and it, that, that meditation is worth the price of the book. This is, as I say, a controversial book. For example, Garrison Keillor does not like it. <laughs> On the other hand, I do. Um, Professor Levy says that rather than give a formal lecture, what he really enjoys is dialogue, a give and take uh, between himself and the audience. Uh, so um, uh, he will um, begin with making a few remarks and uh, we invite you, you'll find um, cards at your, at your seat, to write out questions uh, and um, uh, they'll be brought up to the, uh, the platform and we will uh, commence a dialogue. So, to start it out, Mr. Levy, I wonder if you would tell the audience exactly what your answer is to the problem of how, out of these fragments, we get America, a nation. Thank you, Professor Matasso. Thank you very much. So I know now that I have one enemy, Garrison Killer, and one friend, Professor Matasso. I was the Frenchman who loved America. You are the American ally of Bernard-Henri Lévy. It's a deal. It's a deal. Thank you very much for your words, frankly, from the depth of my heart. Uh, sorry for this little delay. It was a little uh, complication in my, my schedule. Sorry for what you are just hearing, which is my terrible, broken, and, and pitiful English. It is a little better in translated and written English, I can tell you. And I'm sorry for, I hope you will nevertheless understand. Uh, thanks for all that you said. I am, uh, I am actually, of course, all that you did, all that you said. I'm the author of the, all those um, war reports. Um, I am this young man who went in Bangladesh uh, 35 years ago after the appeal, the call launched by my um, our French writer and former minister, André Malraux, uh, on the side of the, uh, the revolt of Bengalese. I am the author of this book about Daniel Pearl, who, who was so important for me, whose conclusion was exactly what uh, Mr. Professor Matasso said, plus an additional one, by the way, just a parenthesis. The conclusion of my book was that Daniel Pearl was killed because he was at the verge, at the border at the, of uh, discovering the links between Al-Qaeda and ISI, but also between Al-Qaeda and um, uh, possible providers of uh, nuclear devices. The real thesis of uh, the book about Daniel Pearl was that, that the real, the book about Daniel Pearl was, had two goals, to redo, to put my, my footsteps in the, to, to try, number one, to investigate on the murder, the killers, the responsible, the plot, the mastermind, and so on, but also to put my, my own feet in the footsteps of um, Daniel Pearl to try to redo the investigation he was doing at the moment when he was kidnapped and killed. And my conclusion was that he was on the trail, on the, the smoking trail, of Abdul Kader Khan, this uh, nuclear scientist who has been arrested since this time, who is under arrest in Islamabad and so on, and who was uh, trafficking, who was uh, dealing some nuclear devices between Pakistan and uh, some rogue states, beginning with North Korea and Iran, and maybe some uh, groups uh, linked more or less with Al-Qaeda. So I am all that, of course, but today and all these days, I am much more simply and uh, much more modestly, much more candidly, 
the, this philosopher who was mad enough, uh, crazy enough, one day of 2003, to accept the proposal of Atlantic Monthly, who came to me proposing me to 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 try to know, to try to describe one century and 70 years after what would Tocqueville have said about America of today. It was an idea of the Atlantic Monthly, your venerable and, uh, and great magazine of Boston now uh, from Washington. The idea was the idea of Colin Murphy, his former senior editor. I began at the when the proposal was extended to me, I began to decline, to refuse. Uh, number one, because it seemed to me so huge. Uh, number two, because it seemed to me uh, too risky to, to, in a way or in another, or even if I deny, to pretend to, to, to redo what such a great thinker as Tocqueville did. It is the biggest risk for an um, intellectual. And um, um, for obvious reasons. And another last reason why I hesitated and even said no when the proposal was extended I, was the reason I gave to Colin Murphy. I told him, yeah, of course, I, I like, uh, I'm a philosopher who likes, who does not dislike to go to the field, to go on the field, on the ground, but my fields generally are, are more, more like battlefields. And Colin Murphy had uh, this uh, great quote this day, this great quote which uh, absolutely, who in, the, in a way contributed to convince me. He told me with his very American, uh, Irish uh, humor, uh, cold humor, he told me, but you know, Mr. Levy, uh, Bernard, he told me, uh, America might become also a sort of uh, battlefield. Battlefield of ideas, battlefield of um, ideologies, battlefield political, and you should get interested in that. And I accepted, of course not for this, it is a joke, but I accepted, I would say, for two, two main reasons, and uh, that's what uh, leads me today uh, in front of you, uh, uh, in front of this fine and very numerous crowd. The first reason was I wanted to fight against anti-Americanism, but the second reason was I wanted to make a state of affairs in my own modest eyes of a foreigner of what is what is happening what is going um, around american democracy today first reason anti-americanism for me was a real concern it is a concern since a long time in all my life i have fought against anti-americanism not only because uh, because it is stupid, not only because I, it is always stupid to hate uh, a country as itself, uh, and so on, but because for very egotist reasons, for very national reasons, I believe that in my country, in France and in Europe, anti-Americanism has a very special, very nasty and very dangerous role, dangerous function. I believe, I wrote that 25 years ago already, a little, and I go much deeper in the topic now with American Vertigo, that anti-Americanism is the real core, the real core, the real center of the worst, of the, of the, the worst of the worst ideologies in France. Um, to say it in a few words, uh, it is generally admitted that anti-Americanism comes from the left and is, in wa is one of the slogans and cliches of the left. I think, I prove, I demonstrate, and I'm ready to do it if you wish, of course, that uh, the real roots of anti-Americanism in France and in Europe in general come from the other side of the political spectrum, come from what I hate most in the world, uh, for personal reasons as well as philosophical reasons, which is the tradition of the French extreme right. Of course, anti-Americanism migrated after that on the left side. Very often today it expresses itself in the language of the progressist and the left, but the birthplace, the nest, the stem cell, the beginning of it, the roots are on our French fascist tradition. This can be demonstrated very accurately 
um, looking to the history of our ideas, uh, Drieu La Rochelle, Brasillac, the tradition of Charles Maurras, who is the founder of our uh, rightist extremism. You can consider it the way you want. Anti-Americanism has to do in my country and in Europe and now all over the world, all over the world, not with what America is or is not, not with America does or does not. First of all, it is more, it deals more with that, with what America is than with it does, and not even for um, with what America is, but with what with what America is solid with in the mind, in the fantasies, in the phantasm of the anti-anti-American, which means democracy, a certain um, way of um, um, building a nation, and I will go to your question, and so on. To say it in a, in a few words, regarding my country, at least, France, but this can be extended, the fascist tradition in France had one nightmare, had one ni absolute nightmare. This nightmare had a name, which was the name of Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was the author of a book which is called The Social Contract, and The Social Contract was a book which said that the best nation in the world, the most free, the one which would provide to the citizen the biggest quantity of freedom, of liberty, is the nation based not on common roots, not on a common and shared soil, not on an ancient race, not on a common blood, but on an act of will pronounced by people coming from very different places, having very different uh, roots in the past, in the world, and so on, but deciding to form a nation. This was a nightmare of the extreme right in France. This was a nightmare of the European fascism in general because it went against their strong belief, their real will, which was to have some natural national communities based on an, a pure ethnic origin, based on the dream of um, the fourth, the absurd, the criminal dream of a common blood, and so on. This for them was a good nation. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau opposed to their old dream this idea of an act of will assembling some people having nothing in common except the act of will. And of course, at the beginning of the 20th century, the French ideology discovered that the, their nightmare had a body, that this uh, crazy thinking of Jean-Jacques Rousseau had found a place in the world to embody itself, and that this place was America. So America in France, in Europe, and today in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, all over the world, is solid with that, is consistent with that. This hatred of this idea of a nation or of a democracy, relying not on a community of blood, on a community of roots, but on an act of will. So for me, the fight against anti-Americanism is since since always, because I, I know that since always, I know that since my my youth, I know that since the time when my my family told me what meant America for, for, the, for us and so on, this fight was essential. And the first reason why I answered to the proposal of Colin Murphy was that. I know that to the best way to fight against the delirium, the best way to fight against uh, madness, the might way, the better way is to see reality as it is, to go to the facts as they are. The way was, the best way was to, to take a car, to take the road, to take the model of Kerouac as well as the model of Tocqueville, and to, to cross this whole country from uh, coast to coast, north to south, and, and so on. Oppose the reality to the myth, oppose the facts to the dark, mad, crazy, uh, 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 myth of the anti-Americanist. That the second goal for me was that, of course, I am friend enough, I am fond enough of this country, I am close enough to him, I have fr um, enough friends here and so on uh, 
to know, to not ignore at least, that this country was not considering anti-Americanism or not as itself was at a very special moment. September 11, of course, this um, attack on the national soil, uh, the feeling of a new vulnerability, the negation of the Tocquevillian theorem. Tocquevillian said that the geographical position of America made that it could never be under attack that her geography um, implied a certain relationship to the war, to the peace, to the being a nation, to having enemies, to the, sh the future of uh, Mitian uh, theorem, a friend, enemies, and so on. All this was split out, of course, was broken by September 11. The war in Iraq, with a real strong, deep debate going on in this country, which, was, which is generally neglected abroad. I knew, because uh, I am connected with, that, with what happens here in this country, which is so deep, to, so dear to my heart, that there was a real debate going on between politicians, between intellectuals, inside the neoconservative movement, the neoconservative groups, between Charles Krautramer and Fukuyama, between uh, uh, Christopher Hitchens and uh, Bill Crystal. I knew all that that there was a, a real, uh, more than debate, and a, a, a quarrel, a deep fight, uh, one of those quarrels which engage the destiny of a people about this question of the democracy in Iraq. Beyond that, I, I knew, I felt, uh, that uh, on the question of the religion, for example, this religion which is so linked to American identity, so linked with what it means to be a free American. This is the thing which uh, Alexis de Tocqueville foresaw. He said that America is the only country in the world where democracy, freedom, and religion go the same pace. Tocqueville said that uh, in France, in Europe, the more you have religion, the less you have freedom, or the more you have freedom, the less you have religion. He said that in America, it is the contrary. It is this exceptional country where the two, for historical reasons, for theoretical reasons, for reasons, for theological, theological reasons, for reasons which are consistent with the very way in which God is thought, seen, and adored in this country, go the same way and go the same pace. I had some reasons to believe and to feel that something was going on again in this country, in the, in the churches, uh, in the worshippers, in maybe the substitution sometimes of big mega churches to the old traditional American churches, which could imply, which could induce um, a modification in this uh, old balance between the two. So for these reasons, and for many others, I had the feeling that America was as, at, the, at the crossroad, that America was in, uh, in a sort of a crisis of, uh, of identity, and that this old question, which is the very, um, which is uh, que la devise de l'Amérique, la devise de l'Amérique, et pluribus unum, et pluribus unum, the motto, mot motto, motto, this um, old motto of America, uh, drawn from uh, the Latin poet Virgil, e pluribus unum, who has al always been at stake in all the political debates in since two centuries. Of course, there is a discussion, a dialectic between the pluribus and the unum, the articulation between the two. I had the feeling that at this moment, maybe the crisis was reaching a sort of uh, burning point, a sort of a climax, maybe due to many of the things which happened in the 60s and in the 70s, maybe due to the civil rights movement and its great achievements, maybe due to the claim and the victory of uh, the movements of minorities who, who tended to stress on, to accentuate the pluribus uh, at the, um, uh, for the bad of the UNUM, and so on. For all these reasons, I had, of course, as everybody in the world, and uh, I think as many Americans too, that 
the democracy in America was at a very, at a very special and very turning moment of its uh, um, history. I wanted to see that. I wanted to bear my, my own testimony about that. I wanted to check with my foreign eyes if this miracle of the e pluribus unum, this miracle, this incredible balance between the diversity and the unity, this mystery of this nation after all, this nation, as Alan Wolf says, nation after all. We are in Europe, nation before all, the nation avant tout. We are nations since, the, we pretend to be nations since the beginning. We pretend to be nations before even we were nations. America, it's a different model of a nation after all, after the act of will, after the resolution of the pluribus uh, uh, crisis of identity and so on what this democracy, this nation, after all, since uh, living, of course, since uh, still vibrant, I think, too, also, and uh, still in the position of being at the height of her destiny and of her um, uh, mission, because I believe in that, too. I believe that we are, France and America, we are among the few countries who have a special duty toward the world, but America much more because of the power of America. Is America still in the position of uh, holding the promise of its destiny and of its duty? This was also my question. And um, my answer in American Vertigo is, at the end of the day, all being said, yes, I believe so, in spite of many things, in spite of the crisis it uh, crosses, I think that it is still à la hauteur de sa uh, à la hauteur de sa destinée. And I think that the, this um, this paradox, um, this uh, unique case in the history of humanity of the Rousseauist country, this country which has no name, which has no name, United States. This is not a name of a country, United States. Uh, America, it is not a name, United States of America, it is twice no name, twice no name. We call uh, Espagne, uh, France, uh, uh, name of uh, supposed old tribe, uh, the, uh, the Frank tribe, and so on. America, uh, it's uh, the name uh, out of a Florentine cartographe, uh, Americo Vespucci, Etats Unis, a sort of uh, uh, hijacking of the whole name of the whole continent. This is not a name. So the miracle of this nation, after all, without having a real name, without having this real consistent flesh which produces so often the worst, which is having some roots, having a supposed blood, and so on this nation working without all that, but still working, still dealing with his destiny, still feeding the patriotism of, his, of her sons and daughters, this miracle still works, and it was the, one of the most, uh, the biggest surprise, and good surprise, of course, of this investigation and of this book. So this is my answer to your question, Mr. Professor. And this is the reasons which lead me in front of you, my friends. So, if there is any question. Yeah, we're, we are, uh, I don't know if this is on. Uh, we're going to take written questions. Uh, so, uh, first of all, let me uh, acknowledge the presence uh, of the French Consul General in the front rows. Sir, we, we welcome you. Um, the Consul General of the Rice University, welcome. There are, there are a number of interesting questions here. Having reflected on uh, nationality in America, this question really wants you to reflect on nationality in France. And it, the question is, do you have any views on um, the recent riots uh, by um, uh, Muslims in, in France? Of course, I have views on that. But I have especially views uh, on the comparison between the riots in France 
and the riots which you knew yourself in America in the 70s, 80s, and the last one in the beginning of the 90s in Los Angeles, in California. Of course, I could not help myself during this journey, which happened to coincide also with that, with these riots in France. I could not help myself, I could not prevent making the comparison and see one a delight of the other. If I do that, I would say that um, comparison means, implies necessarily who deals the best, who deals better with the topics which are involved there. I would say that on, on the one hand, we French deal better with the problem. On the other hand, you Americans deal better with it. The, the hand in which we deal better, I would say, Either, and it is very important, the short-run terms, the handling of the riots, the way of mastering them, the fact that uh, the government of Mr. Villepin, Sarkozy, Chirac, they solve, they, they, they put back the calm in our suburbs without one dead, without blood. If you compare that to what happened in the beginning of the 90s in Los Angeles, of course, without chauvinism, it is a, an achievement for us. We did not so bad. And I think that uh, the Californian police uh, could uh, take on this point, on this ground, could take a few advices and a few um, uh, examples on the way it was dealt a few, a few months ago. This is one thing. On the other side, I think you did better on middle range, middle term, long term uh, problems and solutions. I believe that there is something in America of which we should inspire themselves, maybe as much even even more. To say it in a in a few words, my my belief is that we have two different ways of dealing with minorities, of dealing with um, uh, immigrants and that yours in America works better than ours. Ours worked for a long time, the Republican model, which is a way of saying to a new immigrant, you become French. French is the best thing which can happen in the world to you, but you have to deserve and to deserve, you have to forget all that you were before. You have to leave your old cloth on the antichambre. This worked since the Revolution Francaise, does not work today. There is something maybe too rigid, maybe too, not too rigid, I would say too Catholic, too Catholic in our way to deal with immigration. Catholic, I mean, when I say Catholic, I mean, I think, about, I think of the famous word of Saint Paul, Saint Paul. Saint Paul saying to the worshippers, to the new worshippers of the new Christ, there is no longer Jews, no longer Greeks, there is only Catholics. You know, there is only Christians. You have to forget you are Jews, forget to, uh, to you are Greek in order to become Christian. The only problem is that Saint Paul is Saint Paul, and that you have not one Saint Paul every seven years. Every new presidency, Mr. Chirac, Mr. Mitterrand, Mr. De Gaulle, were not Saint Paul. Watch the thing which works once, twice, cannot work in ordinary life. So our model, which had good time, is um, revealing its uh, breakings and its, um, its lacks. On the other side, you have, I believe, a model. I don't know how to characterize it. Is it more pragmatic? Is it more dialectic? I don't know. But you have a way to deal the two terms of the alternative, to mix them, to articulate them, again the pluribus and the unum, the minority and the universality, the being an American and the being what you were and what you still be, the, the manner of saying that the former identity does not deprive, but on the contrary, enrich the being American, which works well. I observed that so many times during this journey. Only one example, only one example far from here, in Michigan, Dearborn, Dearborn, Michigan, near Detroit. Dearborn, which is an Arab city, 
a real Arab city. 80% of the population is Arab and Muslim. And really, strongly Arab, with uh, some uh, McDonald's uh, presenting, offering some billboards, certificating, uh, uh, swearing that the meat is um, halal, with some gentlemen's club which are put under the authority of the Quranic uh, uh, verse, verse uh, with also even a car which I saw with a mock plaque, which was not a very funny mocking by the way, but it was saying Taleb, like Taliban, so a real uh, um, deeply Muslim and Arab city. And on the other side, so strongly American, so patriotically American. I was so surprised. Number one, I remember, and I, I tell that in the chapter of the book devoted to Dearborn, when I finally discovered, but after, after half a day, that the group of people with where I was visiting the city, when they said, we, we believe, we should, we have to, we could not, we, we should not do this or that. It took me half a day to understand that we did not mean we Arabs, but we American. Even when they spoke about the war in Iraq. A total identification, which made me dream, of course. When I think of what is happening in our Arab cities, which live in a sort of a cold climate of civil war a total identification to the American dream. And even a bigger surprise, even a bigger surprise, the moment when I asked, and this also makes a chapter of the book, it was such an incredible moment for me, when I asked to some of these gentlemen, what was their dream for the future? What was their hope? What they, they hope for their children, which sort of integration in America, how they foresee, how they foresaw their presence in the future America. Uh, once, twice, three times, I heard the same reply, the same reply. Our dream is to achieve exactly the same goal, in exactly the same way, with the same tools as the Jews in America did. Our dream is to become the new Jews of America. So maybe there is something so-so uh, in this um, way of thinking. Maybe there is something which we call the mimetic rivalry, which can have some dark side too. But when I thought, when I saw that, and when I thought, when I remember in my country too often, some parts of the Muslim minority, not all of them, far from it, but some parts of it being fed with such a rabid anti-Semitism, to hear that was a, an incredible fresh air, to see some Arabs wanting, to, feeling as American patriots and feeling that they will, that their model in order to become completely true American is the model of the Jews. For me, I could not help myself from thinking that there was something going there, a pattern of citizenship, a pattern of belonging, a way of being this and that, which, which worked, and which worked uh, pretty, pretty well. So, on one side again, on one side, on one side again, our police, your, the police of California could, uh, could ask a few advices to their colleagues in, um, in France. <coughs> on the other side, I believe that in the moment where we are, where we, when we have to reshape our pattern of citizenship, the way you dealt in America since 30 years has to be re reflected. I speak about the Arabs and I speak about the new migrants, but even the old minorities, which are American, American since uh, sometimes much longer than the... the WASP uh, Anglo-Saxon majority, the African American Americans, the African Americans, the way in which since 30 years their um, um, cause was pleaded, the incredible progress which was done since the time of the dream of Martin Luther King, this incredible achievement of the South of, the, of America is uh, 
an absolute example for, for everybody and for every any Western and developed country. I saw that a big part of the book is devoted to these states, Alabama, Tennessee, Arkansas. Uh, I went there with, of course, I, I have to confess, with all the possible cliches of a Frenchman of the question. I expected that every white man in Alabama would be a sort of stupid, racist, machist, redneck, a former member, and maybe still in secret of Ku Klux Klan. It was so the contrary, really. Night and day, such a path. I don't say that there is no longer racist, of course, in a Montgomery or Birmingham, but uh, the difference is that at least they are on defensive. At least they don't dare in the new America of today express. They know that it is, it is wrong, that it is bad, and this changes all. It changes the whole story when uh, the expression of a hatred is censored by the common sense, when it is perceived as a form of evil and not celebrated as it was yesterday in the 50s, in the 50s, where slavery was still going on under another name in many parts of America. When you achieve this result, it means that the democracy works, that the dream is still going on, and that it is attractive enough for all the parties to create peace and to create a democracy. So when I say that, as a Frenchman, of course I am, I am full of, uh, of respect and, full, uh, and it feeds, it nourishes my, my reflection. I might mention that uh, at the end of um, the discussion tonight, uh, Mr. Levy will be over here signing books. So um, after this talk, you cannot possibly not want to buy one of these books, and you will have the opportunity thanks to the Brazos Bookstore. Uh, the next question is, in, is inspired by uh, your long interest and experience in the, in the Middle East. Uh, can you share with us your views of the recent advances, in quotation marks, of democracy in the Middle East, mentioning Palestine, Egypt, not sure where the third country is, but it might be Iraq. And which is the th second one, Egypt? Uh, Palestine, Egypt. Ah. Uh -huh. Is it a joke or is it a serious question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, for me, what strikes me is today, uh, unfortunately, I believe so much on uh, democracy in this part of the world. I'm so convinced that it is the only way of having peace and achieving it. But what I see is the contrary. I see a sort of new triangle of death and of hatred, a new triangle of death, which, is, which replaces, as for my, according to me, the axis of evil of which uh, some Americans talk, and which uh, unites what is happening in Hamas, what is happening in Iran, and what is happening in Syria, which is not completely formed, but which is in formation, forming itself, and of which the cartoon affair, white the feeding uh, incident, a triangle of death. What happened in uh, Hamas, what happened in Gaza is, uh, for all of us, for all those who believe in democracy, such a, a horrible thing. Till now, the state anti-Semitism, the hatred of Israel existed, but in dictatorships, in states ruled by force and came to power by force. It was a Nazi idea, the destruction of the Jews in Israel and beyond was an idea, but it was a, a Nazi one or a fascist one. For the first time, at least since uh, 1933, this idea was two weeks ago, three weeks ago, blessed by a democratic poll, blessed by the, the les élections. And this joined to what is happening in, in Iran, Ahmadinejad, 
joined to the, what we are seeing now, which is that the Shia and the Shiite and Sunni suppose dividing, suppose drawing line, exist, of course, but in front of the common enemy, it is uh, dilated. And what is happening in Syria, all this creates a very, very serious uh, situation. And I have this discussion, not in this term, because these are recent events, but all the end of my, of my journey in America was devoted to uh, encounters, uh, discussions, political ones and philosophical ones with the thinkers of this country who uh, work and reflect about all that and especially the so-called neoconservatives. Uh, this, um, this book had been, has already been um, a controversial one. For this reason, a lot, of, um, a lot of people of my family, which is a progressive or liberal family, believe that I am too kind, too sympathetic uh, toward the neoconservative, which is, which is true, which is in a way true. But I don't, uh, the purpose of the book is not to be sympathetic or not sympathetic, it is to try to say the truth. And it is to try to, together, to advance. And I have on this topic of democracy and the way of building it, a real discussion with, with Fukuyama, with Christopher Hitchens, with Bill Crystal, with Richard Pearl. All this in, is um, in the cameos of the travelogue and in the reflection of the end. And this discussion, if I had to express it, to, to sum it up, to make a summary in a few words, I would say the following. I would say that I, I think, I agree with them. I think they are right and that they should not absolutely be demonized for this, as they are so often in the world, when they say, number one, that Islamism is a real problem. Number two, that it is a third fascism. Number three, that we are at war in front of that. And number four, that the best way to wage this war is to promote democracy in the Middle East. On all that, I share. We come from the same point. We have the same history, our biographies going through anti-totalitarianist movements, the Bosnia affair and so on, leads us all, Crystal and myself, to these points. Islamism is the danger of today. It is really from top to toe the new fascism, the third fascism of our modern times. We are at war against it. It is not only a police affair, as the left often thinks wrongly, in my opinion, in America. And number four, the best way to deal with this uh, war is to promote democracy. I agree with this program. I disagree then from, from this point to the, to the end. I disagree on many things. I disagree on domestic affairs also, of course. This is a debate I have with Bill Crystal, the director of Weekly Standard in the book and we, which we had in public a few weeks ago, frankly, face to face and uh, as friends. We disagree on public, uh, on public matters, most of them. Um, guns control, death penalty, many of those. But we disagree also on the way of what we say and what we decide and how we do after having said that democracy is a goal in the Middle East. And what I would, my opinion about these neoconservatives in America, I say it as I feel, as I feel it's a point of discussion, of course. My feeling is that they, and Crystal admitted it, by the way, uh, even, even if it was as a joke, but during our debate, they are much more Marxist and much more Leninist than I, than I am, of course, I am no longer nothing of that, but even what I was in my long past. They are Marxist because they still believe in a sort of providence is a sort of messianism, in a sort of sense of history. They still believe that you have to have the good intention of promoting democracy, of designing it, and because it is in the sense of history, it will happen. I am much more pessimistic. I believe that democracy is not in the sense of history, that nothing prescribes it, that it is written nowhere, that it is a painstaking history, 
and that uh, uh, it is um, in no way providential. And they are Leninist in the way that uh, that is the difference, for example, by the way, between uh, Christol and Fukuyama, because they believe that this can be done very quickly. This can be done by a sort of conceptual coup d'etat. They believe that uh, uh, even when the conditions, exactly as Lenin said, that it was precisely in the country where the bases were not given, not in Germany where you had a great trade union class, a great workers class, but in Russia, which was completely, uh, uh, completely uh, backward and so on, that communism will happen. There is in these neoconservatives something as a sort of remnant, as a sort of, uh, of a sort of rest of the old belief of the left, believing that number one, there is a, provident, a sense of history with democracy at the end, and number two, that it might be in the places where it is more, when it is less uh, necessary that it happened, that it can happen. Uh, I am much more in favor, for example, of nation building. I am much more in favor of um, the, this patient, painstaking uh, task which, uh, for example, begins to be done in, uh, in Bosnia and so, so slowly. And that is one of the reasons, by the way, why I regretted so much the divorce between America and France at the moment of the war in Iraq, because as one of them tells me in the, in the discussion, nation building, we know how to do. It is one of the little, we have not many, so many, but we have this speciality in France, the nation building um, uh, practice and, um, and, uh, and theory. So that is the point. Of course, I believe in this democracy, but I don't speak it goes forward. I don't speak it is a one-way track. I don't speak it's uh, the, the mornings of uh, the, the week of the, of the seven Sundays. I don't believe, this is my disagreement with Fukuyama, a very important chapter of the book also. Fukuyama believes, as you know, Francis Fukuyama, one of your better thinkers today. For me, one of the most respectful intellectuals in the Western world. He believes in the end of history, which means that he believes, of course, that uh, modern history will know some convulsions, some uh, uh, terrorist attacks, uh, whatever, but that it is all those are like the last little events in a sort of uh, promised, uh, complete uh, peace coming, um, com coming um, ahead. Uh, Fukuyama believes that uh, democracy has defeated with communism the last and the most dangerous of his enemies, of her enemies. He believes that no as real enemy as communism was will stand up in front of her and that the battle is won. Fukuyama deeply believed that. I don't think to force his, uh, his thought by saying that. He really believes that, of course, we shall have some, uh, some convulsions and so on, but that the battle is won. No one will stand up in front of America, Europe, Western values, saying we have another model, alternative, and so on. I believe the contrary. I believe that, uh, uh, as Karl Marx said, by the way, this time, History has more imagination than, the, than mankind. L'histoire a plus d'imagination que les hommes, more imagination like, like we have, and that we are not at the end of our surprises. And that the war against terror, the war against the third totalitarianism, might be uh, a war full of um, very unexpected uh, events and in front of an enemy which we should uh, definitely not um, underestimate. We have time for one more question. Um, you predicted the sinking of New Orleans. What do you make of the mess there now? What does it, what does it tell you about um, the America that you have seen on the road? I don't see a mess. I see, uh, as I said uh, at lunch uh, in front of another audience, I see um, a failure and, uh, and an incredible achievement. This is, are the two things I see after Katrina, a failure and an achievement. The failure is uh, the failure to predict 
not to predict. It was predicted, not by, not by me. I did not predict anything. I just said, I just repeated what I was said every day by the people I met in New Orleans, by those who knew. And for example, <coughs> what was said to me by the journalist of the Times, Picayin, the newspaper of New Orleans, who published again and again, since years, articles, pages, screaming, calling for, for help for whoever, the philanthropy, the, the state, the federal state, and announcing what was going to happen. So the failure was the failure to hear, the failure to listen, not the failure to predict. It was predicted. Everybody knew that New Orleans was built under the level of the sea. Everybody knew that the levees were too weak on various points. Everybody knew that the, the way in which the city was built and organized put it in a, in a very serious uh, danger, and so little, not enough, was done. Not enough was done. So there is a failure. Is it a failure of the, of the private initiative, as I was told at lunch? Uh, is it a failure of the state? Is it a failure of the federal state? Anyway, you can turn the problem in the sense you want, maybe the three, but in the American tradition, in, this, in the tradition of the e pluribus unum, in the tradition who, of course, grants the individuals as much power and responsibility which they, they can afford, but which does not delete completely, erase completely the role of the state and the role of the political institution, there is a part of the responsibility which is a political one. And for me, the reason for me, for I think any genuine observer, Katrina is at least a call, is at least a, um, a way of recalling the urgency, the emergency, the importance of the politics in, in this country. I love in America the fact that the state is weak. I like that. I like the fact that the individuals are are really responsible for themselves. I like, in Texas, there is a chapter about that, not here, but in Dallas. I like the way in which the citizens, the simple citizens, decide when they see their um, educational system getting into ruins, the way in which they decide to save their children, to take the situation into their hands, not to rely on, on anybody, and especially not on the state, to save the children. It is a practice of the homeschooling, which is, for a French, completely impossible to understand. We don't, it is not only that we have not the practice of homeschooling, but it is forbidden in France. There is laws, if you pretend to do homeschooling, you go to jail. So this fact in America, of course, I think it is a great achievement. It is exactly faithful to the best of the American democracy, according to Alexis de Tocqueville, the associations and so on. But, but, in the American tradition, in the old debate between federalism and anti-federalism, Hamiltonian and Jeffersonian and so on, you have also the the co you have also the tools, the ideological tools, the conceptual means to think also and to implement also the fact of one of the tasks of a state, federal or, or, sta or state, is to take care of the most, the weakest of his citizens. And more than ever, more than ever today in the post um, uh, modernity, uh, world, and so on. So for me, Katrina is that, not, not a mess, uh, a failure. It is also, as I said uh, at lunch, it is also an incredible uh, image of, um, of hope and of nobility. What I said is that when I, I came in, uh, in New Orleans and I came in Texas before Katrina, and after Katrina. And after Katrina, what, what I saw, which I would not have seen, which I would not even have conceived anywhere, and not, not more in America, was the incredible image of the average citizen of Texas. The average citizens, the normal, plain American citizens, uh, 
whatever their opinion, uh, Democrats or Republicans, peu importe, no matter, taking care of the refugees, of the survivors of New Orleans, but by th tens of thousands. And this image, this spectacle of those tens of thousands of survivors arriving in uh, Houston, in Dallas, in Fort Worth, and this image of the citizens of those cities um, protected, who were untouched by the drama, opening their, their hearts, opening their houses, opening their hospitals, opening their schools, welcoming those people with whom they had nothing in common except this very fragile and abstract thing which is the creed, the American patriotism, which is rely on a few sheets of paper, le, the Constitution, the way in which I saw and the entire world saw the citizens of Texas um, implementing this solidarity, this generosity, welcoming, helping, give, giving shelter to their co-citizens of the state, the neighboring state, Number one, I'm not sure it would be conceivable in my country. I'm sure it is not conceivable, thinkable in Europe, which is also a sort of États-Unis de Europe. Uh, I said um, before that um, if the disaster had struck Germany and that the Germans, and I say in the book, this is the end of my of the of the reflections of the of the second part. If the disaster had struck there and that the German refugees had come to France. Uh, I'm pretty sure that we would have reinvented the border for that. <laughs> so this is a, this is really was really for me a good uh, an incredible surprise, a huge emotion for my uh, for one who like me likes this country with all his heart. It was such a reconfort. It was such a, um, a reconfort, and it was. I don't know if it was, I don't know how it was done, how it was dealt in the minds of those who did that. Was it a proof of Christianity? Was it a way to, to, to give shelter to your brother in, in faith? Maybe, but it was much more than that for me, or equally, equally, an incredible sign of the vitality, of the vibrancy, of the uh, youthfulness of the, of the American uh, democracy. So the mess is the superficie of the of the problem. Be, beyond the under the mess, under the mess, you have a, a huge task to to undertake, which is to rebalance, maybe in a more balanced way, the responsibilities of the citizens and of the institutions, and not only about levies, also about uh, maybe healthcare, maybe about huge poverty. I saw during this journey, and I tell it, this this book is a is a book written in love of America. But when you love, you say everything. Also, what does not go well. So I saw so many distressed neighborhoods in big prosperous cities. I saw in Los Angeles, in Boston, in New York, in Chicago, in Las Vegas, in Las Vegas, such gray areas of nearly under humanity that I cannot conceive that this can be solved only by the old, good, old process of social natural mobility, American dream, keep moving, the border is beyond, and so on. I believe that there is this stake today. Without renouncing to this American individualism, which has been the pride and which is the strength of this country, but rebalance it with a a rethinking of the the role of politics in uh, in social life and my bet after having met so many so many americans in red and in blue states in the republican camp and in the democrat one my bet is that if i am here in two years and a half i'm sure that this topic will be at the at the center of the debate right and left even um, on the two sides and under the mess, there is the, the vibrancy of this, uh, of this democracy, which remain for me and uh, for, uh, for Europe 
and for the world and in the Middle East. And more than ever, because it is burning hotter and hotter, which remains a, a light, an example, something which, uh, which has to be uh, defended and proved, the American democracy. So Katrina was also a plaidoirie, was also a, a proof of a testimony, a witnessing of this, um, of this vibrancy, and especially in Texas, where I am glad to say these few words tonight. I thank you very much. Thank you. I remind you that thanks to the Brazos Bookstore, uh, Mr. Levy will be signing books uh, on my right. Buy here and sign there. Oh, okay. You can buy here and sign on the other table? Thank you. It's okay. Thank you very much. Thanks.